on the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Glad you are with us on Tuesday, May 25th. We are talking about uh, an issue that has been very controversial in, in North Nashville. Really controversial for many all over, but in North Nashville especially. The Metro School Board recently voted to close uh, four or consolidate, which led to closing four metro schools. Uh, this was especially uh, of concern in North Nashville where those schools are located. So we're gonna talk about that decision tonight. We are very happy to have with us again via Zoom because of social distancing. We have with us the council members from the affected areas. We have Jonathan Hall, he's Metro Council Member from District 1, and Quante Toombs, Metro Council Member from District 2. So we'll turn over now to Zoom. Thank you both for being with us. Thanks Welcome for to the year. So we're talking about four schools. The school board unanimously approved consolidating these schools. Uh, it was said that they were underperforming, they were under capacity, and that the looming budget constraints due to COVID-19 is what led to this decision to close these schools. The schools were Buena Vista Elementary, Robert E. Lillard Elementary, Jolton Middle School, and Cone Learning Center. So those were the four schools impacted and that will be closed. I'll start with you, uh, Councilman Hall, no relation. <laughs> um, what, <laughs> what is your thought about this? Well, it, admittedly, it's been a, a frustrating situation for all involved. Um, I understand completely that MNPS has got to make some adjustments. Um, I think the frustration on our part um, from a community standpoint is the decision and how it came about um, and the engagement component, not until the 12th hour where we really weren't able to impact that, that conversation about what should happen. And so um, between that and then it happening just past the open enrollment deadline, which furthered the parents into uh, a little chaotic situation. I, I think we can do much better. And I'll, I'll ask you the same question, Council Member Toombs. What is what is your concern? Um, what what should be done? So I definitely understand the the financial part that um, because these schools are under capacity that it was costing more to keep them open. Uh, MNPS has a uh, student base uh, type funding where the money follows the students, so there weren't enough students in these schools uh, to cover the operating expenses of the schools. So I completely understand that. But as a, an elected official myself, uh, I understand the importance of community involvement, having community engagement, and it doesn't appear that there was a lot of community engagement. It, the decision seemed like it was last minute, that it was rushed. Um, and the community and the feedback I'm getting from my constituents was, is that they didn't feel like they had a voice, that this is something that happened to them instead of with them and, and asking for their input. So you can have the best plan, but if you don't have that community engagement up front, you're pretty much dead in the water. So the uh, Adrian Battle said the global pandemic and budget scenario accelerated the timeline. That's what she's quoted as saying uh, in an article I have here from the Tennessean. So you're both saying that it was there wasn't a lot of community engagement beforehand, but could it be that they planned on that, but then we have the pandemic and we have to accelerate the timeline and there just wasn't time for the community engagement? I mean, what, what, what do you think about that? And Councilman Hall, I'll start with you. Um, well, everybody's having to adjust to the pandemic. Um, but then that brings the question, what was the timeline originally? because being priority schools, we've heard year in and year out for the last four or five years. I know with Robert Lillard and Jolton and those schools, we repeatedly ask, what is a priority school? Is it actually a priority? What is the plan for improving these priority schools and getting enrollment up? And so we were under the impression that those plans were what was taking place, only to learn last minute again that those plans have completely shifted. And the savings isn't that large of a savings. The savings, I think they said, is $3.4 million to the district annually, $3.4 million. And so, Council, Councilwoman Toombs, 
I guess take us into the real world implications for a family that has learned this. You have a family that has a child at Buena Vista Elementary or Robert E. Lillard Elementary. It's closing. How 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 under um, how how under capacity were these schools and where does a family go now? What what happens now that the district has made the decision to close and consolidate them? I believe that the the schools that they closed were hovering somewhere in the forties as far as their the capacity of the school, so less than half uh, capacity. Uh, as Councilman Hall mentioned, the open enrollment period has passed. The lot the lottery deadline has passed. So uh, parents who may not be comfortable sending their kids to their new school, um, they don't have the opportunity to participate in the lottery and to choose another school. They can be waiting listed for another school so it's really putting parents in a tough position uh, you also have schools that uh, perhaps the parents felt like they were making some progress I know that's the case with uh, Joseph Middle School parents felt like the culture was changing there uh, also I know a lot of work has gone into uh, Jones Padilla uh, Elementary School um, which is going to be receiving um, students from Buena Vista Elementary School and so for those parents it, this change feels like a setback so they feel like that their student may possibly be losing something in this consolidation and that may not be true but that's the sentiment of parents and for we all know that perception is reality so uh, a lot of parents are feeling uh, stuck um, and, and lost right now, really. School board member Amy Frog said during the debate that charter schools have dismantled North Nashville schools. What do you feel like the impact of charter schools has been um, in, on North Nashville schools and certainly with what has happened to these four schools? And I'll start with uh, Councilwoman Toombs on that one. You know, I haven't really waded into the, the charter school debate. Um, my children attend uh, public schools. I, I know some charter schools perform well, uh, some don't. Uh, so I do know that it is a financial impediment for MMPS uh, because charter schools get their money off top. Uh, of whatever money is allotted to MMPS and, and those schools are not subject to the oversight of the school board. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a problem for a lot of folks that they're mm -hmm. essentially, they're public schools, but they're not under the scrutiny of the publicly elected school board. Um, so I, I can't say whether or not charter schools has uh, uh, had a severe enough of a negative impact on North Nashville schools. I do know that obviously since the schools are under capacity, a lot of folks are choosing to send their schools, send their students elsewhere. Um, but I think that's more of a reflection on our public schools um, that the parents don't feel like their children are getting an adequate education. So they're looking for something else. Uh, Metro schools is slated to spend about $145 million to fund 30 charter schools next year that's out of 929 million dollar budget so 145 million out of 929 that's a that's a significant amount what do you think councilman hall do you think charter schools are are hurting are hurting schools in north nashville or, or what do you think well to your point that you just made about how much is going toward charter schools um charter schools weren't even asked to take a cut this year it came up last week during the, the budget here when the MMPS came before council. Um, that conversation hasn't even happened to ask them to reduce what they get to ease the burden on MMPS. And so I think when you're having a conversation in the financial situation that we're all in, that every stone must be turned over. And that's a huge stone that has not been moved a bit. And so um, I think that's part of the conversation that needs to continue to happen um, rapidly before, you know, our, our budget vote. Um, in addition to that, you know, when you can see line items for charter schools every year, but again, you hear of a plan, but not see a budgetary line item on how priority schools are going to be improved, then it presents a problem. Um, school choice is a good thing for parents. But we know that community schools, like the ones that have been consolidated and closed, are 
part of the community in a different way. They are the heart and soul of the community. Homeowners buy homes based on the school district as much as they do the physical home itself. So it has a massive economic impact on communities. But then the way communities bond together and interact with one another and children growing up through a feeder system like this is part of with the White Street Cluster, it has an absolute impact beyond dollars and cents. Yes, and, and there are some on the school board who said this was not created by charter schools. Now, obviously, Amy Fro mentioned charter schools in the debate. Others did not. The bottom line is it passed unanimously on the school board. It was a unanimous decision. They said it was a tough decision. Um, what I don't see as I, I look over this, and I'll, I'll turn to both of you, and you answered this a little bit, uh, Council, Councilwoman Toombs, how under... Um, how, how not full were these schools? When we talk about that they weren't uh, at capacity, how under capacity were these schools? Buena Vista Elementary, Robert E. Lillard, Jolton Middle, Cone Learning Center. Um, you know, how, how, how under capacity were they? And, and do, we, do either of you know, can you, can you put some numbers there? Uh, Councilman Hall, what, what about that? I think they all were, as Councilman, uh, Council Member Toons mentioned, between 35 and 45 percent capacity. Um, which is, it, I get that, I get it. And, and I've, I've made mention the last several days about the chicken and the egg portion of that. Um, why was enrollment down? Why were they at that capacity? If a school is deemed a priority school and that school is not showing improvement, then that in turn makes parents want to send their children somewhere else. So, Everybody, I think, has a role to play in this under capacity conversation. More to that point, we've asked for the last two or three specific years, um, I know in my district at, at a variety of meetings, what was the plan for improving Robert Lillard? What was the plan for improving Jolton Middle? Were we in danger of losing White Street High School, which is the high school for the cluster that all these feed into? Well, if you told us, no, you're not closing Robert Lillard, and now you're closing it, you told us you weren't closing Jolton Metal, but now you're closing it. If you tell me you're not closing White's Creek, it's at 27% capacity. So wouldn't it stand the reason that just it's going to close also, regardless of what we're being told? Well, the budget constraints could accelerate some things. I mean, we are in unprecedented times as far as uh, the coronavirus, I guess. How concerned are you that this would mean others will close? And, and Councilwoman Toombs, I'll ask you that. I mean, that, that's an interesting point. When you talk about there's a high school at 23, 25% capacity, I mean, that's pretty under capacity. Are you concerned that other schools will close as Metro deals with these budget constraints? I was muted. I think that is a concern considering that that was a large part of the rationale for closing uh, the four schools that, that we're discussing tonight. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding Whites Creek High School. I've gotten a lot of feedback from constituents who, uh, even though a plan has been presented for a, a, a new uh, uh, a program where students can earn an associate's degree as well as their high school diploma. It sounds good on paper, but there's not a lot of trust in the community. As Councilman Hall said, uh, parents were told that Robert E. Lillard wouldn't be closed, that there's going to be a plan for the schools, and now those that school is closing along with some others. And so there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding Whites Creek High School. And as the council person for the area, obviously I want there to be strong schools in the district. And if they're they're closing, you know, if they're being consolidated, it doesn't send a, a good signal to parents, and it's going to make uh, parents, uh, current parents, as well as new parents moving in, uh, more likely to send their um, kids mm -hmm. to school elsewhere. What would have been another way? We're obviously we do have budget concerns. We're talking about uh, 3.4 million, not tons of money, but uh, boy, I mean every every million counts when when we're facing the budget concerns that we're facing. What uh, councilwoman would you have liked to have seen done what could have been done differently is it just the communication um, or or do you feel like there was a way to keep these schools open and that way was not explored so the the, the money problems are real I think that the communication um, that was missing is key 
um, had there been better communication with parents, had the school board and the uh, school director laid out here are our options this is what we're facing and gotten input from the community i recall as a, a candidate last year that there was the mmps next and those were a series of community meetings where they were talking about you know how to improve the schools and consolidation was mentioned but it wasn't presented as this is what we're doing this is the plan and so it, it really was last minute um probably two weeks notice hey here's our plan, we're closing and consolidating these schools and we're moving forward and droves of parents came out. When you have hundreds of people come out uh, against the plan, you really need to slow it down. And uh, the feedback that I got from some school board members was that, you know, if they delayed the vote, then there wouldn't be time to prepare uh, for the upcoming school year. But with the coronavirus, uh, the upcoming school year is, you know, it's up in the air as well as far as what that looks like. Is it gonna be virtual learning? Is it gonna be in-person learning? Um, so, uh, so there's, it's really the community engagement piece. Maybe this needed to be delayed a year and, and other uh, financial options looked at. The point was that there just wasn't that robust discussion that there needed to be for a decision like this. And I'll ask you the same question, Councilman Hall. I mean, is there, uh, what, was there some other way here? Uh, obviously, you're concerned, uh, frustrated about the communication, about it, it happening so quickly. Is there, what, what else would you recommend that they do, aside from better communication about it? Is there a way that you feel like these schools could have stayed open, or what, what, what do you think? Well, that's one of the things we won't know without more communication. Um, I know we firmly believe that um, we would like to see what other options were considered and put dollars and cents to those options to see which one was the most viable and which one fit those communities in particular best. Um, that's community engagement. And that's, these are the, we're educating these children for their parents and for their families and they have to believe and trust in, you know, that we're giving our best uh, effort. And so I think putting to them real school choice would be, what do you see in terms of how we educate your children and to see if we can make that come to fruition. So I know for, out of my district, my council district, that um, parents and parent-teacher organizations had other plans that they'd like to sit and discuss, that, you know, options that they think were viable options. But until someone sits down with them and has that conversation, and again, put dollars and cents to, to each option, we won't know. Why were these schools, I'll ask this question, then we'll, then we'll go to break and we'll start taking some calls. But in, in both of your opinions, and I'll start with you, Councilwoman, why were these schools um, so under capacity? It does not speak highly of the confidence that parents had that, that so many parents made a decision to send their children elsewhere obviously there was love for these schools people are concerned that it closed but why were they so under capacity and why were they so underperforming i mean what what does this what does this highlight about what has been happening uh, in your opinion and i'll ask you the same question councilman hall well i, I can tell you you know you're always going to hear and i'm sure you'll have several callers to this point um about the historic underfunding of MMPS. Um, let us clarify a couple of things. First and foremost, as council, we write the check, but we don't have say in how it's prioritized or spent. Mm -hmm. Moreover, we will not rest until we find every penny that we can provide for MMPS, but um, we can't give you what we don't have. And, and that's where the conversation has to begin and end on that. Um, we are by charter required to give you the same or more than the previous year. And if we don't have it, we can't give it. And so in our efforts to continue to try to find every dollar, um, it's hard on everybody. But do I believe firmly that, you know, other conversations should take place before this happens? Absolutely. I mean, we don't even know what the COVID 19 um, money that's allotted to Metro and to the schools can be used for. Who, what's to say that some of that money wouldn't be accessible and able to stave off one more year of closing these schools while we continue the conversation? 
And you're talking about the 121 million, is that what you're talking about? That has not, that's part of the CARES Act? Is that what you mean? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll add, yeah, Councilwoman Toombs, same question. If the schools are not at full capacity, in fact, not even at half capacity, they're underperforming, what does that say about the schools? Obviously, they were, they were loved by parents who are concerned that they're closing, but there's, there's a bigger problem here. And, and what, how do we address that? So there's a, there's a lot of reasons that go into why a school could be underperforming. Uh, under being underfunded is a, is a big reason. Also, you have to look at the schools in North Nashville. There hasn't been a focus um, on equity um, in North Nashville in, in past years. There's been more of a focus maybe in the last couple of years on making sure those schools have adequate resources uh, to take care of the kids that are in those schools. Uh, you, you've seen in the past year or two more of a focus on social emotional learning. A lot of our kids come to school with a lot of trauma. Uh, so it takes a lot for teachers to even get to baseline so that they can teach students. If you're coming home, coming to school with a lot of baggage, um, you know, maybe you're dealing with poverty at home. I know District 2 is about 35% of the residents in District 2 live in poverty. If you're coming uh, with all of that baggage to school, it's difficult for you to learn as a child. And so there's been a recent focus on that social emotional learning, but historically there has not been a focus on that and, and equity. And so those schools have been overlooked. They've been neglected. And that's why you see a lot of the, the underperformance. And so, um, People who move into the district who live in the area uh, don't choose those schools as they have school-aged children. Also, the zoning of the schools. Uh, my children aren't middle school age, but they're zoned for, they were zoned for Jolton Middle School, which is seven or eight miles away, and Haynes Middle School is a mile away. So you have to look at how the, how the schools are, are zoned and is it um, set up so that the people in the neighborhood will come to those schools. And you, you say those schools have been overlooked, um, underfunded, and, and they're gonna be people that, that are in other parts of the county who see that a huge percentage of our budget, of Metro's budget, goes toward schools. And so how is that happening? How is it that these schools are overlooked and underfunded um, in, your, in your opinion? Because I know there are gonna be people asking that, and, and Councilwoman Toombs, uh, I'm asking you that. So how has this happened that these schools have been overlooked, underfunded? So oh, you have uh, MMPS is one of the largest school districts in the country. I think it ranks 40th, 86,000 students. So that's a lot of uh, students and it takes a massive amount of money to educate that, uh, that number of children, uh, to have the staff, the resources and everything that's needed to provide a, a quality education for 86,000 students. Uh, so that explains why such a large chunk of, of our budget uh, goes to MMPS plus our, per state law. Half of our sales tax revenue goes to MMPS. Um, so I think that when you, but when you're looking at uh, District 1, District 2, these are primarily African American districts. Uh, we know the history of Nashville, of Tennessee, of the country, that uh, minority communities have not gotten the resources that they needed. Uh, oftentimes you have parents who are working two and three jobs to make it make ends meet. So maybe they can't come to a meeting at the school um, during the times that are that are open to come. So um, oftentimes you have a, a parent community that may not be able to be as involved, not because they don't care, but because they literally do not have the time because they're trying to feed their kids and, and keep a roof over their heads. And so I think that the systems in place have, have, have taken advantage of that and used that as an excuse to not pay as much attention to our schools. But now parents are getting uh, more involved. Um, you see larger numbers coming out and they're saying, hey, we're tired of, of not getting the resources that we need. Something needs to change and it needs to change now. So it's not a surprise that minority communities have been neglected. Um, I think that now is the time to really um, hold the school board accountable, hold our elected officials accountable so that those schools get the resources that they need and people can feel comfortable uh, in sending their uh, kids to their community schools because they know they'll get a quality education. And Councilman Hall, basically the same question, but if, if, if they aren't being properly funded, um, is the school board responsible for that? Do you hold them accountable? Uh, again, how, 
I think that was a, a great answer. But in your opinion, how is that happening? And, and do, you, do you hold the school board responsible? Why, why does it keep happening, in your opinion? Well, I, and, and I concur completely with uh, Councilmember Toombs. Um, it is a reality. It is a fact. And you see those schools in some of those traditional African-American communities only improving post-gentrification. Um, so it begs the question, if the resources can come later, why couldn't they come before? Mm -hmm. And so if we're talking about equity and how resources are dispersed, um, you can have a lot of conversation around that. Again, unfortunately for us as council members, we have no say in how any of that is prioritized or budgeted. Um, we just write the checks. And so what we're attempting to do is have a different type of dialogue and conversation um, mm -hmm. surrounding those things so that there is more equity and there is more accountability, both on council's part for trying to find additional funding and create that, that revenue that's so desperately needed, but also on the MMPS part. I mean, you have to have uh, at some point, a conversation around accountability because we've seen more done with less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Okay, a, a great conversation. We're going to take a break. We've gone a little long here. And if you want to call in, the number's right at the bottom of the screen. There it is 615 737 plus. 615 737 7587. Hope you'll join the conversation. We'll take a break. Be back right after this.